little trailer, if you've seen it, it ends with Richard Aoki and his little cane with a panther on it. Mm. Ready to go. <laughs> but he's, you could get this, this sense, his, his, his intellect, his, his oratory skills, his wit, and the film really captures his personality as well as documenting important history. Scholarly work of documenting and analyzing Richard Aoki's life is part of my larger research that uncovers the hidden histories of Japanese and Asian American activism and places that history within the long freedom movement that connects activism of the 60s and 70s with earlier periods across regions and across racial boundaries. As with any narrative, there are many ways of viewing a given event. Akira Kurosawa famously captured the concept of multiple interpretations in his 1950 film Rashomon, starring Toshiro Mifune. The film depicts four characters, a bandit, a woman, her dead samurai husband, and a woodcutter, each telling a different version of the same heinous event, thus revealing how ego, face-saving, and varied reasons affect what one chooses to tell and what one remembers. The truth or any story is never singular, but is interpreted through many lenses. A Kurosawa's film gained international critical acclaim and generated the phrase, the Rashomon effect, to refer to these multiple subjectivities. In the same way, my book on Richard Aoki does not depict a singular truth on his life. One of the major dilemmas I faced when, when um, writing this book was what format to use. When Richard invited me to write his biography, he wanted a collabor collaboration, and he also wanted me to tell his story. So we embarked on hours of oral history interviews. He also asked me to do additional research because as an intellectual, he wanted me to check the facts. And as he said, if I checked his story, then who could contest it? And, but as you saw in the trailer, Richard is a great storyteller. And while wonderfully funny, it also raised certain flags for me. Right. Military exploits and clashes with the police over the details of organizing and personal relationships. I fleetingly entertained the idea of making this a third person biography where you know, I would write it in all of my words, but it was important to preserve the strength of Richard's oratorical cadence and style, his dynamic storytelling, and to honor his story. So after much contemplation, I decided to center the book on Richard's narrative, but to insert my scholarly interpretations at the end of every chapter, as well as in the intro introduction and the epilogue. And this is a rather unique format and not one with which everyone will agree, but I stand by this. The format provides a kind of conversation between subject and biographer, enabling the reader to decipher Richard's narration in his own words while adding scholarly complexity to fill in historic details and offer other interpretations of history, politics, and social justice struggles. So the book creates a kind of a Rashomon effect, though clearly not as deliberately or dramatically as in Kurosawa's film. So the book is based on months of multi-day interviews, mostly three-day marathon sessions where we would work from late morning till late after, till after dinner. And I came up about once a month from Santa Barbara to, to the Bay Area from January of 2003 to March of 2004. In addition to 100 hours of recorded interviews, there were hundreds of hours of you know, informal conversations and what researchers call participant observation which means hanging out with Richard, but with the observant eye, right? <laughs> um, I also interviewed 26 of his activist friends, his professional colleagues, uh, personal friends, family members, and combed through the archives at UC Berkeley, Merritt College, College of Alameda, Berkeley High School, the Oakland Public Library, court records, police records, FBI files, and elsewhere. You know, I spoke, when I spoke of this Rashomon effect and multiple versions of the same story, um, but I wanted to share with you how I made interpretations. So we're seeing kind of one comparison of the way Richard did, does his story and the way that I kind of constructed Richard's story. Another type of narrative construction that I want to compare and contrast is on the Third World Liberation Front strike at UC Berkeley. Um, done in the works by the recently released book by uh, Seth Rosenfeld, and compare that and contrast it to the way that others, including myself, have characterized and framed that movement. Mm -hmm. 
So in Seth Rosenfeld's book, he has one chapter on the third world strike at Berkeley. And on the very first page of that strike, he makes three points that sets up the framework for his discussion on the third world strike. First, he opens the chapter with the physical confrontation between a white student and the third world striker. And I asked, you know, I was looking and seeing, what does that skirmish have? It was a minor skirmish, and I kept thinking there must be a reason why he's um, using this one minor thing. I was expecting to see something come out of that. But nothing ever came out of that one little story. But what this story seems to do, is there seems to implicate violence on the part of the third world strikers, and it also seems to pit white students against people of color. And that's not what the strike was about. The strike was a struggle against white supremacy as a system of oppression, but it was not against white people, per se. The second thing that Roosevelt does on his very first page is he sets up another divide between the non-violence of the free speech movement and then the alleged violence of the third world strike. And the third thing that Rosenfeld does on his very first page is he charges Aoki as being an informant. For Rosenfeld, Aoki becomes the almost the main figure of the third world strike, or one of two major leaders, when in fact the strike, like it did here at State, promoted collective leadership, and there were at least a dozen very visible third world strike leaders. But by magnifying Aoki's prominence, Rosenfeld amplifies the significance of his own discovery. And I think what's particularly significant is that Rosenfeld writes within the bifurcated good 60s, bad 60s historiography. And the, the framing goes like this. The early 60s represented the good movement, when activists were making reasonable demands and working through non-violent methods. But the late 60s represented violence and militant demands and overturned all the gains of the early 60s. This liberal perspective has been widely challenged by activists as, as well as within the academic scholarship. But Rosenfeld, deliberately or not, continues to write within this vein. Violence is the center of his discussions of the Third World Strike, and he seems more disturbed by the violence of the strikers but then by the greater violence of the police and the government. When Rosenfeld begins his chapter with this minor skirmish between this white student and, um, and the third world strikers, he largely ignores the more vicious police violence against strikers, such as Chicano leader Isidro Macias, who was beaten so badly that he required hospitalization, um, or against black strikers like Cordell Abercrombie or Jim Neighbors, and also, I found this in the pages of the California Daily, a white student who was a bystander who was so disturbed by seeing the police beat a black reporter that he yelled at the police, but when they didn't stop, he kicked the police. And in return, to try to get them to stop, right? And in return, he was taken to the basement of Sprawl Hall and beaten into semi-unconscious and had his two front teeth knocked out. Rosenfeld also uses material selectively and out of sequence to buttress his emphasis. For example, at the beginning of the strike, a fire broke out in Wheeler Auditorium on UC Berkeley's campus. While Rosenfeld notes that another strike leader condemned the fire, he quotes Aoki as saying, well, he didn't know, this was in an interview later, he didn't know who set the fire, but Aoki says, but if I knew, I'd give him a medal. But in what, what Rosenfeld doesn't say is that at the time, in early 69, uh, the Berkeley Bar quoted Aoki as saying, I personally disavow petty acts of vandalism because they are petty. That's exactly how I felt, and I stated, who was responsible for the fire? The university. The university had set up the conditions for the violence to get unleashed. So rather than accurately portraying Aoki as to paint a picture of Aoki, uh, and the third world strikers as violent. Uh, Rosenfeld cites an another author, Curtis Austin, to condemn the violence of the strikers, while failing to mention Austin's central premise, which places violence in a larger context. Black Panther Party co-founder Huey Newton argued for the need for self-defense by any means necessary because...